Welcome to Travels Free Time, the podcast made in partnership with Colograph. I'm Peter Moore. Today we're off to the 19th century on a playful global tour with a much admired historical novelist. By the time that Queen Victoria came to the throne in the 1830s, Britain was a sprawling, brawling merchant empire. And one of the most morally suspect activities that it was embroiled in was the China trade. That was the selling of Bengal-grown opium in and around the port of Canton. In the 1830s, this trade became the source of a bitter conflict. On the one side were the lusty merchant adventurers of Britain. On the other was proud, ancient and insular China. This week's guest takes us back to this fractious history. Edward Rutherford is one of Britain's great writers. Educated at Cambridge and Stanford over the last 40 years, he's written seven bestsellers, epic historical novels set in places like London, Paris, New York and Dublin. Last month, his new novel was released. In China, he portrays the great clash of East and West. I enjoyed talking to Edward enormously just the other day. Edward Rutherford, thank you very much for coming on to the Travels Through Time podcast. It's a real treat to be talking to you and to get your take on a period of history which is endlessly fascinating. But let's start with the novel, which is the instigating factor that has brought us to this um, this conversation. And I'm going to begin with asking you about a quote, which is from, from the book. You say, it's early 1839, one of your characters, an Englishman called Charlie Farley, is chatting away to his friend in Bengal about Canton and the China trade. What was the China trade? Can we start there, please? Uh huh. Well, the China trade st- started off by being the tea trade because uh, all tea at that time was China tea. Indian tea scarcely existed. And the British became obsessed with China tea. Uh, and it's amazing how empires can, you know, rise and fall on something as unimportant as a cup of tea. But um, in order to get the tea and other goods from China, you know, the exported uh, porcelain and other things, but mainly tea, they had to pay for it in silver. Um, and it so happened at that time, there was a worldwide shortage of quality silver currency. So what were they to do? And they figured out a triangular system whereby they would get the Chinese to supply the silver with which they would buy the tea. So the Chinese were just getting their own silver back. And the Great East India Company, which was effectively the British government in all but name, uh, set up great opium plantations uh, in Bengal. We shipped the, I say we because the, the, the trade was mainly the Brits with, by the way, a large number of Scots, in especially. I'm caught a Scots mm. myself, so I appreciate this. They, uh, they shipped the, the tea to, as it was called, Canton, Guangzhou, and then just offshore, they would slip the opium across to the, um, to the Chinese pirates and smugglers, get paid by them, and then bring the silver into uh, what we call the factories, which really is an old fashioned word. A, a factor is a merchant. So the factories who were allowed to occupy a strip of land just on the edge of this Chinese city that was known as Canton. And there they would buy the tea and then they would take the tea back to England. So that was the China trade. And it was massively pro- uh, profitable. The Chinese tried to stop it because there was so much opium coming in, they'd got a little of their own opium, but I mean, nothing even remotely like this. Uh, And it was, they felt rightly, it was rotting the country. Mm, You write really evocatively about this moment of of 
connection between the traders, the merchants that had come over from Bengal and the, uh, I suppose they would be the smugglers operating off the coast in their scrambling dragons, that's a word which uh, stuck with me, and their little coastal vessels and taking it in. And I thought it'd be quite good as well as a contextual thing just to talk about what China was at this point in its history. You write, it's true that the emperor China sits at the centre of the world and that he rules by the mandate of heaven. That's uh, an opinion expressed by one of the characters in the novel. Um, so there's two ways of talking about China. It's from within and from without. Could you talk a little bit about what China was in the early 19th century, please? Yeah. Uh, the China that we chiefly remember in you know China, China's general history is, of course, the great Ming Dynasty, the Shining Ming, um, and you know the vast amounts of beautiful pottery that came uh, out of porcelain to the Western world. And the Ming had huge trading fleets and were not at all cut off from the Western world, either by sea or, of course, on, on the great you know road, the old Silk Road uh, across Asia to the West. But after the Ming fell and a dynasty from the north, which we normally call the Manchu, uh, they weren't the, the descendants of Genghis Khan exactly, but they were kind of like cousins and they came from Manchuria. And they kind of closed the country down fairly soon, um, or closed it in, I should say, and made it almost impossible for any foreigners uh, except a few the Jesuits, and that was pretty much long past, uh, to get into the country. And to give you some idea of just how closed it was, not only were these merchants in their factories not even supposed to enter the city, but the missionaries, the Protestant missionaries, used to have to go out in the opium boats, and they used to have their tracts and Bibles translated into uh, Chinese, and then give them to the smugglers, the Chinese smugglers, and ask them to take them ashore. An extraordinary situation, but, you know, means and ends. That was the only way in 1839 that they could, these well-meaning uh, Protestant missionaries, could get their tracts onto Chinese soil. So that's what I mean by the place being closed. Now, uh, closed in that sense, the Chinese emp uh, empire was huge, and the emperor had all these kind of client kingdoms, including Korea and, you know, what we now know as Vietnam and various other places, all coming effectively to pay tribute. So when at the end of the 18th century, the English ambassador, Lord McCartney, came uh, with a, a retinue of people to uh, meet the emperor, the emperor expected him first to fall flat on his face in the kowtow, and knock his head on the ground nine times, uh, but also to, to give him tribute. Uh, the idea of receiving uh, an ambassador from a, 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 a country or empire of uh, you know, similar status had simply not crossed anybody's mind. And the result was, of course, that they, in fact, without knowing it, became very militarily backward, especially militarily. You know, their, their soldiers, some of them had antiquated muskets. You know, they still had cavalry with and bows and arrows and pikes uh, to fight against, when it came to the fight, the Opium Wars, to fight against the um, well-trained Brit British troops and above all British so uh, naval So we vessels. should, I suppose in a way, envisage China as to some extent being a hermit nation is that right is that or is that taking it too far no i think i think it's right and by the way the same could be said of japan you know um and uh, the the difference was that when a little later this commodore uh, perry you know, isn't he? He comes uh, perry into right. Bay, yeah. commodore perry they, they then transformed themselves and did a total about face with the major restoration so you know the chinese were i think more proud and, you know, bigger, mightier, and, uh, as you know, changing the culture uh, of any organisation mm. is very, very difficult. The effects and, uh, of the opium on Chinese society, though, were already profound by, the well, in these early decades of the 19th century, weren't they? The drug was being seen as... Um, increasingly part of a social problem which was coming in from the outside. There's a quote again um, 
which I'm going to take from the novel. And this is an, it's, it's one I particularly like because it captures the view outwards and it says, um, and this is out of a conversation between two administrators in the Chinese system. And they talk about the largest criminals seem to have come from a country called Britain. Nobody seems to be sure where it is. I've learned, however, that this country is ruled by a queen. It's a wonderful little quote that I really like it. And um, I thought I'd ask you a little bit about what the Chinese perceptions of the wider world are, because we have like alighted very briefly then on the star fleets of earlier centuries and the great um, trading missions. Um, how much did the average person in China know about what was happening in the West to this moment of industrialization and explosion in philosophy and knowledge? Was was this removed from their um, understanding completely? Uh, the answer is, what did they know? Is absolutely zilch. I mean, it's unbelievable. My my wonderful editor, um, in, in New York editor, said, I, "I'm sorry," he said. This you, you you said they didn't you know know where Britain was. That that's impossible. I said, "No, it isn't impossible. I promise you, I've done my research." Um, oh, they they thought that all these uh, mm. barbarians, with red hair. they considered us, <laughs> you know, had red hair. Exactly. Exactly. And that we had, uh, I thought that we needed to eat rhubarb, which we imported from them also, or otherwise we would die. I thought that was like garden rhubarb. And then I discovered during my research that it wasn't actually. It's a, it's a herb, oh, but it's wow. also called rhubarb. You could go very badly wrong family, with that, I suppose. bit of advice. Um, <laughs> 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 but no the the ignorance was absolutely astounding and was the, the opium question. which was the other point i was alighting on it, it it was part of the society by that point and causing enormous problems wasn't it oh yes absolutely i mean you know it was partly as i indicate in one bit of the novel you know a rich chinese peasant you know invites uh, you know his neighbors around to see him smoke mm. a rather valuable opium pipe you know, because it's expensive, um, uh, like all sorts of things, like alcohol, I suppose you could say. You know, the, there could be a certain um, cachet to it uh, if you got the good stuff and you had a fancy pipe to smoke it with. Uh, if you went to an opium den, you just got mm. a cheap clay pipe. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we all know, especially today, we're only too well aware of the devastating mm. effects of opiates. Absolutely. Well... Let's get going on our little journey into the past. I'm going to ask you this inciting question now, which goes in the direction of anyone who comes uh, to have a chat with us. And it's this. If you could travel back through time, which year would you pick to visit? I would pick 1839, uh, leading on directly from this conversation. The emperor sent down to Canton uh, and a, a wonderful guy, actually. His name was Lin. Commissioner Lin, and, you know, there was plenty of bribery and corruption, um, as in many imperial administrations, but it was there in China as well. And this man was incorruptible. And he came down and was determined to uh, stamp out the opium trade. I don't think he had a great view, uh, understanding of economics, but uh, he did succeed in doing this, and it involved laying siege to these factories I mentioned to you, to the settlement, the merchant settlements. Now, when I say laid siege, obviously with millions of people, he could have just killed them all, uh, but he didn't do that. He frightened them and made their life completely impossible and uh, laid on a siege so they couldn't get in and out and they were not quite starving, but, you know, seriously, seriously discomforted. And there were shows of force and so on. And this went on for quite a long time. And it, it, it begins in, in the book with, as always happens, you know, the, the local uh, people who work for the local servants, as they would have been called then, uh, suddenly all disappear from the houses. And everybody has to, you know, fend these merchants, who mostly, by the way, stayed in Canton at the factories for the selling season, uh, mostly uh, just men only, and their wives had houses out at lovely place, Macau, uh, at that time. This is before Hong Kong, of course. So they all had to do their best, 
And for instance, one there were some American merchants there as well, also in the opium trade, it must be said. And one of them famously, a guy called Delano, um, he had to learn how to boil an egg, which took him some time, but he then became quite good at it and was known as the guy who <laughs> boiled the eggs. So um, uh, finally, the British appear to give way. And when I say that, the guy in charge of the British man called Elliot says to Lynn, all right, we will surrender all the opium we have, but we, the people surrendering it to you, are not the merchants, it's the British government. And I don't think Lynn quite understood the subtlety of what he, of what, you know, Elliot was doing. Elliot then took all the opium from all these merchants, gave it to the Chinese, but of course, then by destroying that, they had destroyed British government property. And the Chinese didn't quite figure that out. They thought that the British had all repented <laughs> and they had not. They were just waiting to grow the next season's opium. Is this your, your first scene? This is where you'd like to be in the thick of all of this? My first scene therefore begins like this. My first scene is that uh, most of the British had already decamped from the factories. There were a few Americans left, one or two Brits, and I would like to join them. Uh, I would like to have a breakfast with three of them, actually, uh, a merchant called King, another called Bridgman, and the Delano, because he's going to cook the eggs for us. I'm the one that joins the party. And so uh, Delano doesn't go because, because Commissioner Lynn hates Delano, but the other two, he doesn't mind. So we go, we take a boat, and we go down to watch the opium being destroyed. And this happened a little way down, down the Pearl River, and beside the river, uh, Lynn uh, builds three gigantic basins, which he fills with lime, and then they pour all the opium into it. And then they pour water into it. And when they've got this disgusting and it stank, this huge mixture, and, and the quantities were enormous. I mean, there were 20,000 chests of opium coming from the firm Goodness of Jardine Math Matheson or Jardine Matheson just alone, just from them. There they go, they throw, they about to empty this disgusting mixture into the river. But first, first Lin goes to the temple and warns the river god that this is about to happen and he's terribly sorry about it, but it really has got to be done. And then they let it go. And my guys watch all this. I watch it, I'm disgusted by the smell. And then Lin summons us over. And this is what he did. He summoned these two men over to talk to him. He had interpreters. And of course, I joined them. And when he discovers that I am a Brit and that I'm not in the opium trade, he's absolutely thrilled. And he says to me, and this again is what happened. I have written a letter to Queen Victoria saying to her, I'm sure that she cannot possibly know about what her merchants are doing, this, this terrible opium trade. And if she is a moral person, she will tell them to stop at once. And here's a copy of the letter. He said, I don't trust the British I've given it to, to deliver it to her. He wasn't wrong about that. Perhaps you wow. could do it when you get back. So I take a copy of Commissioner Lynn's letter to Queen Victoria. Well, I'll let you put it in your pocket for a minute because this is—I want to ask you some questions here. This, this is so visually immediate—the idea of the destruction of opium in yes. in such a, I don't know, huge quantities that it, it is a, a challenge. I get the impression here, um, listening to you, that um, uh, Commissioner Lynn is someone who has impressed you during the research for the novel. He thought that if he destroyed all the opium pipes of the Chinese, which he did to the best of his ability, huge bonfires of them. If he stopped the merchants, uh, you know, bringing in opium, um, then that should do it. And he could maybe put some patrol boats out to stop them, you know, coming in again. Uh, he also wanted to, to make the British uh, sign a bond to promise not to come back and to be subject to Chinese law if they broke it. And that Elliot, the head Brit, would not sign. Hmm. Um, the last thing they wanted to be uh, was to be subject to uh, Chinese law, which could be quite severe and might involve things like torture, you know. Hmm. Um, 
which of course Lin felt they should because it was they were in his country. Um, and that was a long run, running dispute uh, between the British and the Chinese that went on for decades, which is why all these places, you know, um, like uh, Canton and Shanghai and so forth, were actually um, under British law for British citizens. In fact, for all, for all foreigners, all non-Chinese. So it was his attempt to get control of the situation. Mm. And he was rewarded for this, and the emperor loved him until later on things didn't go so well. Mm. So the he's at one side of this dispute. The other side are the people that you're standing next to these merchants of which Delano is the American representative and there's British ones as well. I just wanted to ask you, because you write about this in the book in, in ways that um, are maybe surprising and revealing, there is a particular type of person that becomes a merchant in this trade. They're adventurous people. They're not always the most, you know, say the, the most expensively educated. And you write saying that if someone, for example, had a degree from one of the better universities, they might be regarded with suspicion. There was a real character of the merchant adventurer, wasn't there at this time? Oh, I think it went right through many, many parts of British society. I mean, my own my own grandfather, which is, you know, he, he started his military service at the time of the Boer War, uh, which is not that long ago, I suppose. And he loved to read books about uh, Roman history, but he kept them in a, tr a locked metal trunk under his bed because he didn't want any of the people in the regiment to know that he read books and generally in London you know people <laughs> yes people that weren't weren't great weren't great readers mm. oddly enough I mean somebody like Elliot who of course who was uh, both uh, in the navy but also a diplomat uh, would have been more educated and funnily enough Jardine and Matheson the two greatest merchants of all were quite highly educated men uh, with degrees from um, Edinburgh think, University, was it? Edinburgh, I think both of them did. Certainly one of them did. Mm. Yeah. So it wasn't quite as simple as one might think. And that's, uh, you know, that's why I kind of mixed it a bit. I just liked the idea of, of, of pretending that one had a past degree, <laughs> which meant that you'd sort of been there and, you know, hadn't done all that much work from Oxford, as opposed to an honours degree, which meant you'd actually earned a mm. degree in the, in the modern sense. What more can we say about this scene? It's tremendously vivid. It feels charged up with historical energy because we know about the wars that are coming, even though, as you point out, if you were there at that moment, you wouldn't quite know what was going to happen next. But... I suppose you'd certainly have a sense that there was going to be a confrontation because you have a very proud empire in China squaring up to um, an industrialised trading nation like Britain. So I don't know. That's that... exactly right. And the great symbol of that is, is you know, just a little later on in what became the first opium war, when, uh, of course, a steel, um, a metal ship arrives. This is called the Nemesis. And the Chinese, I mean, it was the first the British had. And of course, the Chinese hadn't, not only did they have no idea about the range and accuracy and all the rest of it of, of British um, cannon, um, but when they were faced with the, uh, actually, they were rockets as well as uh, cannon on this, um, this great metal monster, this dr sea dragon um, that uh, came up to uh, Canton. I mean, they simply had no defences against mm. it. You know, even their huge forts were just pummeled. The cannon were fixed. Uh, the Chinese cannon, which they had, were very ancient and were fixed in place. So they couldn't really maneuver the cannon properly and they aim them. And in any case, their range was nothing like that of the British cannon. So they were sitting ducks. Wow. This is really the beginning of the first opium war, the scene you're describing, isn't it? It is indeed. That's exactly right. That's what precipitated the, 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 the war, because then the British, of course, needless to say, then went to Parliament, uh, and Parliament was quite divided, actually. Um, there were plenty of people that didn't uh, approve of the opium trade, including uh, the young, then still Tory, uh, uh, Gladstone. Gladstone fulminated against this immoral trade, 
though he didn't particularly mention the fact that his own money, which was quite large, came from his grandfather's slave trade. And yeah. The, the Badsons were slave traders. Mm. But anyway, it was split, but they finally decided they could not brook this, um, you know, this uh, seizure of um, British property, um, this defiance of all that they thought was normal diplomatic relations, and thus the war began. And they didn't mean it to be as, much, as big as it was. Um, they thought they'd just knock them about a bit. That's Eliot's phrase, um, you know, and then they'd give in. But a long and very complex story, which I try to tell in, in the novel, um, it, you know, it, it went on for a while and finished up by the 1860s by the total uh, humiliation of the Chinese Empire. Well, let's keep going anyway, because we've got um, a bit more geography and a bit more history to cover. Where would you like to go for your second scene, please? <laughs> we're still I in like 1839, so we're traveling for you. Are. We are indeed. And my, my second scene uh, is in October of that year. And by the way, without the magic that you're providing me with, <laughs> the magic carpet, it could just be done from early May, which is that scene I just, uh, sorry, early June, that uh, scene I just described, you could just get to Windsor Castle, if you were lucky, by mid-October. Right. OK, and that would be uh, going through, would the Suez Canal be operational by then? I'm not sure. Or would they have no, to go round no, no. to the oh, bottom? No, no, just really much later. No, no, you had to go right the way round. No, Cape of go Good right Hope, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we have a young queen on the throne, as you hmm. may recall, uh, since 1837. On uh, the 10th of October, Albert arrives at Windsor Castle, having decided he really didn't want to go at all, and the Queen having decided she really didn't want him to come, but it was sort of arranged. And then he arrives, and she hasn't seen him for some years, and he is uh, filled out. He's, uh, in every possible way, he's become this very, very attractive man. And she falls in love with him at sight. Five days later, she tells uh, Lord Melbourne, her you know, beloved prime minister, that she thinks perhaps she might like to marry him. And in the blue room of Windsor Castle, on the 15th of October, just the two of them together, she, because she's the queen, so she does the proposing. So they get engaged immediately. But nobody is told, Melbourne knew, but it was a kind of state secret. I don't quite know why. The one person who incidentally was told almost last of all was Queen Victoria's mother. Um, <laughs> she had to wait over a month. Well, that seems thoroughly logical to me. I it does, that. doesn't it? Doesn't <laughs> it? So that's the 15th of October. And on the 17th of October, in another room in Windsor Castle, there is a nice little concert. As I say, nobody officially knows about this. Albert is still just there as a princely guest and cousin. Uh, Melbourne's uh, at this little soiree, a musical soiree. Uh, so is the Duke of Wellington, by the way. And I join them. And uh, that morning, I have bought in England the new photographic apparatus, uh, just really that appeared that very year, of Daguerre, as in daguerreotype. So I'm very thrilled with this. And there's Victoria and there's Albert. So I start telling Albert, as I have a feeling he might be interested in uh, uh, about this uh, wonderful system. And he thinks it's wonderful. And uh, I say, of course, you have to have a 10 minute exposure in a bright light to take a photograph. And he said, well, why don't you come back and take a photograph of, 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 of the queen? Uh, because she'd certainly sit still for 10 minutes. And so, well, I said, I, 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 suppose I, I suppose I could, sir. Yes, well, I'll do that then. I'll do it as soon as possible. And then I tell him about the letter that I have, the letter from Commissioner Lin. And I tell him about the opium trade, and he's rather shocked. And he said he'd like to see the letter. And I said, well, sir, I, I, I suppose I could give it to you to, to give to the Queen, I'm not sure. And at that moment, Lord Melbourne appears at my side. He is the most charming man. And he said, look, I, I'm awfully sorry. You can't really give uh, Commissioner Lynn's letter uh, straight into the Queen's hands, but give it to me and I promise you that she will see it. Wow. 
Well, 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 I'm... So I'm... I yield up the letter. And of course, I realise afterwards, I promise that she will see it. Could well be a diplomatic truth. She may see the letter, just not the contents. Yeah, she might see it from quite a distance or something. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, oh, well, th listen, this is good. This is great fun. And I'm, I'm very entertained by the by this vision of you moving through these important diplomatic moments in the British history. It's, of it's, course we should... Oh, I'd like to live. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah man, me too, of course. But there's a, there is contemporary events of throwing kind of more meaning on these scenes because, of course, the Duke of Edinburgh died a few months ago and that was um, obviously a great royal romance, a long marriage, a long-lived queen. And it's the same here in a way, isn't it? There are echoes of this, um, you know, moment of, uh, I suppose, two young people falling for one another. And Absolutely. And she especially fell for him, but he found her attractive. So it was all right. Um, uh, and, and they certainly um, produced a lot of children. Hmm. Um, he had, as did the Duke of Edinburgh, this very, very difficult role because, and she, it, it's quite extraordinary, you know, how modern in a way she was. Of course, but partly she was so thrilled, as we've already said, to get away from her mother's influence. Um, but she told him in no uncertain terms that, uh, you know, she would obey him all in all things and all that, but and and she did you you know use the obey in the in the wedding, uh, in the wedding service which took place the the, the following February. Matters of um, uh, all royal matters must be only through her. And when he said, "Well, surely shouldn't we go away for two or three months honeymoon?" she said, "Of course we're not going away on honeymoon. Quite impossible. I've got all this royal business to attend to." Uh, we can go down to Windsor for two days. Then it's got to be back to work at Buckingham Palace. Mm. So he felt, you know, he wrote to some of his family to say, I'm slowly establishing myself in charge, as it were, here, you know, building myself a little position. Um, but actually, he was struggling terribly. They worked side by side. They had a sort of double desk arrangement. Um, but she was the boss. And I like this, um, I like this, you know, kind of detail that it was quite a private engagement. And um, I suppose, again, that's a lingering uh, point of contention for us. We think about the private life of public figures, and it's been much spoken about recently, how much right do these yes. these royals who represent us have um and this is mm. a this is something which is being played out very much at the moment and of course what role should they perform the duke of edinburgh very famously had to create one but if he had mm. one model it would be prince albert who loved this kind of um front-footed scientific culture which of course he, he, he was a, a moving spirit in the great exhibition, yes. wasn't he? So he probably would like the daguerreotypes. I think that's um, that's a good way to get into his confidence. Was he mm. always, was he quite a modern figure, Albert? Oh, yes, he was. He was a very highly educated man. Yeah, yeah, great reformer. He reformed all the royal finances. Uh, remember the, the great exhibition, Crystal Palace and all that. Mm. That was all his doing. And he was, you know, head of all sorts of scientific institutions. And so in that sense, again... Um, really like the Duke of Edinburgh, but possibly even more so. The other thing about, can I say something about royal privacy? privacy? I, I would be very interested, yeah, please. Um, you know, well, two things. First of all, let's not forget that in the first months of their marriage, which, as I said, took place just in, in February of, of uh, 1840, um, the uh, uh, Albert and Victoria were shot at and attacked several times when riding out in their carriage. Um, and uh, I mean, some of these people were just lunatics, but it was scary. Uh, so, I mean, we complain about paparazzi. Mm. Um, I mean, the royals have been attacked in recent decades. Of course, there's one notable time in the Mall with uh, Princess Anne, Princess Royal, as she's now called, and Mark Phillips. But um, it, yeah, they they had their they had their moments of, of harassment and danger. The extraordinary thing was after Albert died, as you know, Queen Victoria went into virtual seclusion and refused to see anybody. For, you know, it was only Disraeli who finally dug her out. Mm. Um, I, I'm not sure if you could do that nowadays, really. 
but she certainly felt she had the right and she wrote letters saying you know i cannot imagine any of my subjects would imagine after such a terrible event that i could be you know induced upon uh, even to open parliament mm. so uh, she was claiming a huge prerogative which is far far more than anything any modern world would even dream of and this is fascinating historical context these just debates we have today of course but the um, the other thing I wanted to ask you before we um, before we meander onwards is um, this link you're establishing between Commissioner Lin, who's over in Canton, and really squaring up to the merchants of um, the China trade and mm. Queen Victoria. Had that letter, which travelled around the world in your suitcase or whatever <laughs> method of transport you, you fancied. I believe, yes. Had it, had it found its way... To the Queen, what kind of agency did she have as a political figure? Was she the kind of person who could influence things at this time, or had, as a um, you know, kind of young woman, yeah. um, new monarch, these kind yes. of things? Was she, you know, and and did she have that kind of moral aspect that she would care? Oh, I think uh, well, two things. First of all, I think that at the very start of her reign, there's a, we can't really go into it all now. There was something called the bedchamber crisis, where she asserted, you know, that she could have around her only the people of the political party she liked, and she tried, she hated the Tories, oddly enough, and so she tried actually to overreach what we would think of as being the constitution uh, nowadays, but she couldn't ultimately, you know, prevent. Uh, as he was Robert Peel, the, the new prime minister after Melbourne, she, who she loathed, although she late, later became great friends with him. But, she, you know, she couldn't actually stop the business of parliament. Um, but could she have moral influence? I think the answer is yes. Um, and the, the business of my saying that Commissioner Lin, Lin confided the letter to me, um, <laughs> it's not only being a novelist. I mean, he did send the letter by several channels in the hope of getting it through. I mean, he was enough of a bureaucrat, you know, to, to guess, I would, I, I would guess, uh, that, you know, you couldn't be sure that people would deliver such missives. It was somewhat difficult to understand because it wasn't very well translated. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they weren't well served by their translators. But I personally have no doubt at all in my mind that Queen Victoria never saw the letter. And I also think personally, um, and I'd love to know what any, you know, biographer of Victoria would think. I think that if she had had the letter and if she'd really understood what the opium trade was, and remember people justified it, you know, the same arguments that we've heard on in modern times, you know, oh, well, there's no harm. Everybody takes a, a little laudanum. You know, you give laudanum to children, even Queen Victorian takes laudanum sometimes. So, I mean, if you go and overindulge, I mean, whose fault is that but your own? Um, and that was, of course, the argument used. It's been used for other industries since. Yeah. Um, but I think if she'd really understood what was going on out there, I think she'd have made a bigger stink than, well, she didn't make a stink. Mm. But it's, it's also, as much as anything, it's a little peek into the, the Chinese state of mind that there's this moral outrage going on that's being committed by this, this barbarian nation. So what do you do? You write a letter to the Queen. <laughs> that's a wonderful kind of... Because you, as you, you were saying before about the emperor being at the centre of the world, the person whose word is, um, is law, you know, that is... But he's also, he's also a good Confucian. He's, a, he's supposed to be a moral man. Mm. And remember at the court, I'm not saying it was all perfect in the Chinese empire. Of course it wasn't, nowhere near. But, uh, uh, you know, they had the censors, you know, and the censor was there to watch everything the emperor did. And if the emperor did something that was, as we might say, not constitutional, not quite right within the traditional laws or, you know, against, uh, against Confucian morals or whatever, then the censor had the right to tell the emperor, the emperor was supposed to listen to him, and the emperor could not punish the censor. He had to take it. Interesting. So I think that the I think that the uh, appeal to Victoria's morals uh, was 
prob- was was genuine mm-hmm. on the part of Lynn. And I mean, we have the same thing in the modern world. I mean, what happens every time you go to, uh, you know, the international courts of justice or you you go to the United Nations? I mean, this is all about moral suasion. <laughs> Hello, it's Artemis. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd and Colorgraph. Jordan is one of the world's leading visual historians. Through his excellent craftsmanship, he brings black and white photographs of the past to life in startling colour and clarity. Jordan's extraordinary work, as well as that of his contemporaries, can be found on the website colorgraph.co. At colorgraph.co, you'll be able to explore the process and history behind the colorization work, but most excitingly of all, you can also buy some of these beautiful photographs as museum-grade fine art prints. They make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past, and they're an excellent addition to any room. Whether it's a colorized photograph of the US Capitol building from 1846, or a candid shot of the Beatles from 1964, You're pretty sure to find something that enchants you. I know I certainly have many times. It's hard to explain really over audio just how cool these prints are, so I encourage you to have a look for yourself at colorgraph.co. What's more, Travels Through Time listeners get 10% off when they enter the code TTT at the checkout. Well, listen, let's see where you go to next. Where would you like to go to for your third scene, please? My third scene is very short and simple. Um, uh, The next morning, I arrive with my photographic apparatus at the gates of Windsor Castle. And of course, by this time, nobody has told anybody about this possible planned visit, which was only being polite to me in conversation anyway. (laughs) And so the the sentry at the gate, of course, won't let me in. But he calls the officer because he's worried about my apparatus. The officer takes one look at it, decides it's an infernal machine, and I'm immediately taken to the local jail. <laughs> OK, well, there we go. It's a good opportunity for us to talk a little bit about photography and its, um, what should we say, its emergence as a new technology in the 19th century. It was yeah. um, the, the daguerreotype, of course, is... Has come over from Paris, um, but there was a British colour type, which is the uh, William Henry Fox Talbot equivalent. Yes. It's different process, but um, process. yes, similar, I- similar idea. But they do yes. talk about 1839 being generally recognised as the birth year of uh, general photography. And um, do you want to just like yes, kind I of will say a word about it because it's a rather funny, it's a rather funny story. Uh, Daguerre. Um, having gone to the Academy of Sciences and et cetera, et cetera, in, in France, uh, impressed them very much. And they, they realized this was indeed a, you know, he'd managed to solve certain technical problems uh, that uh, made this daguerreotype possible. And so the French government bought it from him. Now, at the same time, Daguerre had got an agent in London you know, like a literary agent. And that agent was trying to see if he could get a deal for Daguerre for his invention in London and register it there. And the agent succeeded in doing so. At exactly the same time, within about a day, um, the French government announced that the entire process of the daguerreotype was A, now belonged to France, and B, was being given freely to all the nations of the world by France, which was a lovely gesture. Um, The only trouble was that the license had just been sold for England in England. So when I bought bought my uh, apparatus in England, I would have had to pay... (laughs) Ah. <laughs> as if I'd gone to Paris, I could have got it as it were free. Ah, well, <laughs> but the, 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 in, in itself, I suppose we should say that the uh, even if you had to pay, you'd still probably be quite excited because daguerreotypes are, I think, they're very beautiful things. Oh, if yes. you look back at them today, there's a, that kind of mirror like sheen that they have, they're oh, often yeah. um, covered with a, a glass top, aren't they? And um. Okay. The, the, yes. the famous one, of course, is that, um, uh, and this is actually alludes to something you mentioned earlier on as well about the exposure time, because there's that famous 
view of a boulevard in Paris, which is often remembered as the shoe shine boy. Um, yes, um, sorry, because he was the only person. So someone stopped to have their their shoe shined, and they were the only person static long enough to be caught by the photographic process. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly so, right. Um, exactly right. Funny enough, I put that out on my on my Facebook about two years ago. Oh, did you? Yeah. Well, it's it's <laughs> it's a wonderful kind of mix of history and science, isn't it? And I think that's probably yes. why it's such an attractive thing. And also that slightly absurd. Um, a misnomer of the you know this this great boulevard seemingly being emptied of people yes. and um yes. yeah so so the daguerreotypes are, are fun it's funny to think isn't it because of the process the people were there but they actually became ghosts who vanished well it's also slightly paradoxical in the way that you cap the, the you know the first because they talk about one of the big technical problems was fixing the image and i know if you yes. go back so to say tom wedgwood or someone like that. 40 years ago, apparently he was able to capture these things, but they just disappeared because they would uh, they'd vanish. But it's, it's, it's nicely paradoxical at the moment you can capture people, they vanish. <laughs> so <it's, laughs> I suppose that's, that, that's, a, that's a fun thing with the... Uh, and, of course, you, you just have this, um, you know, and this is more of a generational thing that takes place after 1839, but this growing acceptance or wariness of, of photography. And there's that wonderful scene in the film about Turner, the painter, when he goes to have, have, his, have his photograph taken and he's eyeing it with real suspicion, this new technology, which is might just put him out of the job, you know. Um, <laughs> never, never. So, I love it. Um, just take it. So take us forward in the story of Victoria and Albert. Were they married very soon afterwards? Yes, they were. They were married the following spring. And um, I, I tell you something, I have got a theory about Victoria and Albert. It's very brief, if I may share it with you. And that is, she was very intensely in love with him. She was very intensely jealous. Um, she could throw jealous fits. She once threw a cup of boiling tea all over him in front of a whole lot of, of, of people. She was not easy. Uh, they had this huge brood of, of children. His position was never really quite what he wanted. Um, and then he, he had some health issues. But in uh, 1861, wasn't it? He, uh, he died. And she comes away from it. And she says, but he didn't even put up a fight. And I'm guessing that she was right. And that he was just prepared to go because he obviously you know he'd done all his duty and maybe he just had had enough and I think that that is why she became so obsessive about him as a widow I think it was a massive overcompensation um and that she went you know on and on if only he were there da, 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 um, that he'd been taken from her because she simply did not want to think that he had effectively left her. Mm. Mm. There you are. That's my theory. Well, it's interesting. And it adds something of a melancholy sheen to this, this scene of um, a young romance, really, that we're, we're, we're studying in 1839. And maybe is, is what you're suggesting, if I'm interpreting it correctly that it was not just the royal position which was and it's very famously a cage for a personality isn't it but it was also the mixture of their two personalities was produced and well it was exhausting for him is that what you're saying i guess it kind of is yeah. i'm sorry if i just spoiled everything by no no no, <laughs> no. What, you're, what you're doing <laughs> is hopefully what we try and do which is add a bit more interpretation mm. to the, the facts that we have well, that's, a, that's that's just my my novelists um my historical novelists well i have to say there's, 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 i like doing this format with historical novelists because you've given us essentially a three-act scene which is in storytelling terms at least um a bit of a classic and it's really nice that we've been able to follow um the the plot through with this with this letter which by now seems to have been well and truly hidden away in in melbourne's absolutely um, <laughs> red box or something maybe um let me uh ask you one more question which is material history mm. and we always like to 
come towards this at the end and it's if you could bring an object back yes. to remind you of this little canter through 1839 with us to have with you today in your yeah. writing office maybe i don't know or whatever what would you like i know exactly what i'd like you will recall that i said before i went down to see the opium uh, being washed out to sea that i had breakfast with these three americans and that one of them delano boiled the eggs and at that breakfast, I said to him, you know, Delano, I want to take one of your boiled eggs with me, but I want something else. I want you just to write on a piece of paper that you personally boiled this egg and I want you to sign it. So he did that. And when I get back and after I've been thrown in jail in Windsor, I still have the boiled egg with me. And of course I have my apparatus. And the egg is actually beginning to smell a little bit by then. <laughs> so I put the egg on a table in a bright light. And, you know, I take, a, a, I make a daguerreotype of the egg. And then I can throw the egg away, as I say, for the obvious reasons. And I keep that uh, along with his signed paper. And the reason I do that is because I know what he did not know that his grandson, who would enjoy part of his large opium fortune was none other than Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Well, well, well. There we have it. And you, <laughs> and you have the egg. <laughs> I have a picture. Of well, the you egg. have the a picture of the egg. <laughs> well, I love. Uh, yeah, th this idea of um, joining the opium wars of the mid 19th century with FDR and an egg. It seems to me um, quite ingenious, really, but in a way that uh, we are actually increasingly being brought back to these stories and um, rummaging around to see how our ancestors might have made money and such like. And um, I think that's a, an, an instructive one, shall we put it? And well, we've got we've got FDR, FDR, and the and the opium uh, trade, and Gladstone, and we've got Gladstone and the slave trade. I mean, what more can I offer you? Well, I, I think that's enough for today. I what I what I do want to end um, on though is just a few words on the novel, actually, because what we've been talking about today, of course, is the historical material that informs China, which um, is, of course, billed as an epic novel, but it's tremendously enjoyable. I've been um, completely immersed in it. And um, I think anyone who listens to the podcast will find elements of what we've been talking about right from the beginning. For you, um, because you've written long books about um, Ireland and Paris and New York and London and the New Forest, what was China like as a as a research prospect? Oh, I'd been wanting to do it since uh, since my teens. I had two big, big, you know, as it were, international projects um, that I wanted to do, and one was on Russia, which I did, Ruska, uh, and one was on China. But talking about China with people and thinking about China today, it really hit me that you know, there the was a valuable book, if I may say so, to be done, uh, popularizing the, the history of the 19th century, because I think that so much of what's deeply behind what we see in China today, there are many things, of course, in the mm. 20th century, but the, that great humiliation, the international powers following the opium wars and following the huge internal rebellion we haven't talked about, but the Taiping rebellion, which killed millions of people, um, following all that that happened in the, the in 19th century, I think it explains the psyche on which the present century is built. Mm. Mm. Is it is it known as the century of humiliation, the 19th century? It is indeed. That is what they call it, yeah. the century of humiliation. Listen, this has been a really fascinating conversation and hopefully a good canter, as I said before, through the, through the history of 1839. So, Edward Rutherford, thank you very much for coming on Travels Through Time. My great pleasure. Thank you.
That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Edward Rutherford about the year 1839 and his fabulous new novel, China, which is just out in hardback. It's just a book for these summer months. Some nice news from us. The Sunday Times in London has picked us as a favourite podcast a few weeks ago, which is really quite exciting. It's hard to believe it. We've been going for almost 100 episodes now. And of course, you can browse through the full library of our time travels at our website, which is tttpodcast.com. We've been adding maps of some of the episodes and some of the travels recently. So do go and check those out too. They're really interesting to see. It's Violet again next Tuesday, so I hope you'll enjoy joining her then. From me for now, though, that's it. Thank you very much for listening.